Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, August the 20th, and this is your daily word of encouragement. Uh, we're going to continue to build on that, uh, that theme of self-control we've been talking about this week. Earlier in the week, I, I used David, King David, as an example of showing that self-control really is spirit control in the way that he responded to uh, the attacks by King Saul at the time when Saul felt threatened by David's popularity and that, you know, that God's favor was upon him and was doing everything he could to destroy David. And David had Saul uh, within his grasp, and he refused to take that the kind of vengeance that maybe many of us would have. He exercised self-control that was truly the, the Spirit's control working in him and through him in that moment uh, to help him to make the better choice. Well, we certainly can't talk about uh, David and, and excuse or forget the moments where he lacked self-control and where uh, the choices that he made to move away from God's direction certainly cost him greatly, both personally and also relationally, that you know, destroyed you know in, uh, the fabric of his family in many ways. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. Of course, David's uh, great moment of failure that many of us are certainly familiar with is when he uh, committed adultery where he... Uh, uh, betrayed not just his own marriage vows, but he also betrayed his friendship. You know, uh, the woman Bathsheba that he began to lust after and took a, took to be, you know, took into his own bedroom. She was actually the wife of Uriah, one of uh, David's mighty men, a very close friend and, and someone who'd been very loyal to David. Um, but when you go back to that scripture, uh, it's interesting the way that whole passage starts out. Um, long before the sin takes place, it describes uh, the time of year in which David found himself wandering and walking the halls and the, and the walls of his, uh, of his palace. And it said that it was the time when kings go off to war. And so what it's saying to us is that David shouldn't have been there. David should have been with his men, with Uriah, with all the other men who had been faithful to him and loyal to him, who had fought for him. He should have been with them in the midst, of, on the battlefield, leading them as he had always done. But instead of sticking to those disciplines and those patterns of his life that had helped produce growth in him, that had helped lead others in a, in a significant and, and meaningful way, uh, David found himself wandering, found, wandering around the palace with this idle time and, 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 and where his uh, focus could be easily distracted. And as he was walking the, 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 the halls and the walls of his palace, he happened to look over the wall and he, that's where he saw Bathsheba sunbathing and he began to lust after her. and it wasn't even just that he was attracted to her in that moment um, but that he allowed that thought to linger and to take root and then a plan began to formulate to take her as his own and then when she became pregnant to try to cover that up um, to bring Uriah home from the front lines uh, to make it think I mean, so that he could be with his wife so you know she would everyone would think it was his child but you know Uriah was, was uh, unwilling to do that and so ultimately David had to cover the whole thing up by having Uriah killed I mean, it's just how one, it's just a great example of how one sin just continues to snowball and snowball and snowball become bigger and bigger and create more uh, destruction and pain in its wake. So David learned a very difficult and hard uh, lifelong lesson about the dangers of not um, allowing the control of God, God to take the reins of our life. And we try to pull those reins back and how devastating it, became, it can become. And it made me think of the words of one of the Psalms that is certainly probably one of the David's most well-known, Psalm 139. And the psalm is all about how well God knows us, that God knows us inside and out. He knows everything about us. He knows all that's going on in our minds. You know, it's, this, it's the passage where it talks about how God created, you know, we, before we were ever created, created within our mother's womb, uh, that God knew us. Um, he knew all of our days before one of them came into existence. But I want to focus on the first few verses and then the last part of this beautiful psalm. Um, because it might sound like David is complaining initially that God knows him so well, that there's no place you can go to escape from God. But what I, what I take from this, and what I really believe David was expressing is his gratitude that God knows us so well and that God looks over and watches over our lives and tries to provide these boundaries for us. Listen to Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. Did you hear that? David says, you, you hem me in. 
Now, some people might read that and feel like, yeah, yeah, trying to follow God, trying to, to be spiritual, trying to be religious, whatever term they might use, trying to be, trying to be a Christian, trying to be a follower of Christ. It's too restrictive. It, it prevents me from really enjoying life. It inhibits me. It, it doesn't let me become the person that I really want to be. But nothing could be farther from the truth. What we learn through Scripture and what we know through personal experience when we commit to follow God and to seek to glorify Him is that our best life, the, the life of, of grace and, and truth, the life of joy and peace, the best life that we could possibly have comes from being grounded in that relationship with God. And so when David says, you hem me in, that's a voice of gratitude. Lord, you protect me. You try to put these boundaries, these guardrails in my life to help me, uh, to keep me within these bounds so that I can know and experience your best. Uh, when I have strayed outside of those lines, David knows from personal experience, that's when I have found pain. That's when I found destruction. That's when I've hurt myself and I've hurt others. It's when I've broken trust. And the same thing's true for you and me as well. Be thankful for these boundaries that God has placed around our lives. The fact that God, there's nowhere we can go to escape from his presence. That God has given us, you know, latitude and freedom to make, and, uh, liberty to make choices, but not so we can abuse that freedom. And so that we can exercise the wisdom that he gives to us and live that best life that he has in store for us. The very end of that passage of Psalm 139, David writes this. He says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God. Look within. Anything that is of me yet that is not surrendered to you, Lord, I pray that you would just allow me, work with me, give, empower me to release it. Let it go to your control. Lead me in the way everlasting. God, there's one way that I want to travel through life. And it's on purpose, living with you and for you. That was David's cry. And he knew from personal experience how devastating and how destructive it can be when we step outside of these boundaries that God has placed for us so that we can experience his best. I pray that we too would learn that lesson, hopefully not the hard way, but sometimes maybe because we've gone through those mistakes, learn how important it is to exercise spirit control to produce self-control in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your power that's at work in us. Lord, I pray that we would submit to you today, that we would receive uh, your instruction, that we would recognize uh, the path that you've called us to walk. We would recognize that straying off that path is nothing but lies and deception. And there's nothing there for us but hurt and pain, um, both for ourselves and for others who count on us and who put, put their trust in us. So Lord, thank you for the fact that you indeed hem us in, that you know, you know the path that you've called us to walk. And I do pray, Lord, that you too would search us identifying us, the things in us that are, that are offensive to you, that we too might walk in that way everlasting. We pray all these things in the power of your holy name. Amen. God bless everyone.